this is a piece of poplar. Uh, it's actually getting a little bit too thin at this stage, uh, but I've thickness, planed and thickness both sides, and we're going to cut a semicircle out of it for one of the brake blocks of uh, Master's Mill. Right. These are the first two brake blocks for the big brake wheel that I've made. This is the long lower one, it's in one piece. This is the first of the three upper ones, which make up more than half a circle over the top of the brake wheel. The uh, fixed end here will go through one of the beams, and then this, the rotation of the wheel is this way, and then these links link up with this past the very small space between the brake wheel and the right hand shear and then the second the third and the fourth brake blocks are rigid on this one on that end of this one and uh, in operating the brake lever some very heavy weights pull on this whole assembly and it clamps onto the brake wheel so that we can stop the mill to safely climb up the sail uh, on the outside to attach a sailcloth or to reef it. We would reef one side and then the opposite side or we would spread a sailcloth on one side and then turn it 180 degrees, put the brake on again, do the opposite one and then do the east and the west, as it were. Uh, Andy, all that ironwork is the original, which has been recovered from the fire. Yes, that's all um, all original. We scratched it, this stuff out of the embers, and or out of the ash, and uh, I've had to wire brush it, and prime and paint it. Uh, nothing particularly special there. Okay, now we have finished doing the brake block job on Mustard's Mill. Richard is just downstairs turning the sails by hand and I am going to call for the brake to be applied. Brake on! There we are. Brake off! There it can turn again. That's what they wanted us to do, and that's working now perfectly. Brake on! Lovely. Done. This is the curb ring for Mustard's Mill, and the cap ring that works with it. The curb ring is fixed to the top of the tower by eight studs. Uh, you can see the holes ready for them. The holes are unequally spaced on the tower, so we had to measure from, say, this stud to that one, to that one, to that one, to that one, and so on, and then move to this one and do the same measurements all uh, on the tower. Then we had to come back here and plot those holes and then drill these holes. They've got quite a lot of play in case of shrinkage or slight inaccuracies with the measurements. But we're certainly hoping that when the crane comes that we're going to be able to lift it and we've got, uh, we know where D is on the tower. We can uh, drop it over the studs because we've only got the crane for one day. We've got to be ready. Uh, everything's got to go smoothly. Inside the curb ring is what's called the cap ring. It's half as high. It's made of the same material. And uh, in this case, where this is simply two layers, this had to be lap jointed uh, there must be about 12 pieces or something like that. Uh, then 
when we had finished making it and testing it, and at that stage we had only three millimeters play between these, I don't know whether we, they, uh, what we're calling bow ties, uh, and the curb ring. What's interesting, that was about four months ago, uh, we dismantled it into two halves because we can't transport a five meter ring on, on a truck. Uh, we split it into two halves, both of the rings, and we put it aside. In this week, we've put it together again to test because we didn't want to have a situation where we get to the mill and the uh, cap circle won't turn in the curve, and suddenly we find that we've got about seven millimeters clearance, uh, perhaps a bit more in places. It doesn't matter. Uh, but if it was the other way around, we'd be in serious trouble. So, we're happy that it's going to turn. Uh, so, the next stage is going to be to dismantle again, uh, put the braces back in, the steel braces, into both circles, dismantle it, and then we'll take it through to Cape Town. And then Mike, who's made it so far, will assemble the two rings. One will be on the ground. The other one, the cap circle, will have to be uh, put down on drums because the cap frame, which is being made by John in Cape Town, has to be assembled on top of it and then the cap circle has to be screwed onto that perfectly centrally. So uh, that is really the, uh, the countdown has begun. This was the first stage in the countdown is the, was this testing, and I'm glad it's done. Second will be to dismantle it. The third will be a trip to Cape Town with these two half rings and the stuff that's up at home, the tail pole and the vertical shaft, which all have to be assembled when we have the crane there. The cap circle is screwed onto the framework, which is a three, two big beams, a third one underneath the, uh, the sails, um, and also outriggers from those beams. They all rest on the curve. And we, before a milling day, we apply a mixture of lard and graphite to the top surface here so that the huge weight of the cap frame and the wind shaft and the sails can turn on the surface. So it's got these beams lying on it and spaces in between and that's where they apply the lard and then it, the, uh, the whole cap frame turns so that it can face into the wind. We decided on Eucalyptus paniculata for the wood for these two components that is called grey iron bark. Right. This is the original wrought iron band which the curb was bound with and that's what gave us the exact size of the outside of the curb. It's made up I think of eight different segments uh, each linked together by this wedge which is knocked in. So we also had to arrange the ring so that joins like this also correspond with the two places where we have to dismantle the, the, curve, the curve for transport. Right. We're calling these bow ties because of their shape. We found them amongst the ash on the top of the tower. There are ten of them equally spaced around the top of the tower. We can only assume that they were for this purpose, to keep the wood surface away from the wood surface. We've had to make a flat, because the back of that is flat on the cap circle, and uh, they were attached with, uh, with nails. Uh, nobody will ever see them again, because we never actually saw them in use. Even the person who put the lard on never saw these things. So we're assuming that that's uh, what they're for. We've 
made a request for information from overseas and nobody has been able to uh, shed any light on it. So there they are. Brake wheel, which Mike and his guys have made for us, it's made of American white oak. You can see a few things here. For instance, if we can't buy American white, white oak in planks wider than this, so we've had to laminate all of the components. The cants, as we call them here, are made of two layers. These are called the brace arms, and they're prepared for the wedges, which will wedge the whole brake wheel onto the wind shaft, which passes through. So it'll be wedges from this side and wedges from the other side as well. It's got 47 cogs. They're, they're made of beech, which is an acceptable uh, wood for that. And the most recent job that's been done on it was engraving four very important dates onto it in the order in which they'll pass any given point when looked at from this side, which is the side that the visitors normally see it. 1796 is the year that the mill was originally built. 1935 was the first restoration that we know about. 1995 was the second restoration which we are very aware of. And then obviously now after the fire, this was built in 2022. The cogs are specially shaped with a slight taper on them because the whole brake wheel lies over backwards at 10 degrees and the lantern pinion, which has got round rungs, in, lies at then 10 degrees to this. So it's slightly closer there than, than there. On the outside of the brake wheel, that's why it's called a brake wheel, is the assembly of four heavy poplar brake blocks, which are connected with iron links and a lever with a heavy weight in it pulls that whole ring of brake blocks tight on the outside of the brake wheel. This is the pinion which will work with the brake wheel. Normally about three cogs at a time will be engaging on these what we call rungs. The rungs are made of offcuts from the rest of the mill. There is some eki, there's some bilinga, and there's another very, very black wood which we can't even put a name to, out of which we've made components for the cap frame. In the same way as the brake wheel is attached to the wind shaft, this one will be wedged to the vertical shaft, which goes up the center of the mill and the edges here are prepared at the same angle as the wedges which have been made. Uh, same story, in from the top, in from the bottom as well. The rungs themselves are round here but square at the end. Between the round section and the square there's a taper so these uh, plates are uh, cut out with a special taper cutting tool to match that before uh, the rung becomes square. The idea of the square is that the rung can be used four times in its life. So the upper section can be taken off, we can pull it apart, we can turn it 90 degrees and put it all together again. This is the new tail pole for Mostert's Mill. It's 7.3 meters long. It's made of actually a lamination of four lengths of spruce, all glued together. I had to make a four inch hole through it, exactly in the center and square for the capstan, which is a big, like a ship's wheel that passes through here, which is used to turn the cap of the wind, the mill into the wind. Also, because a 
of the fire last time we want to be able to sprinkle water onto the thatch in a dangerous fire situation so I've added a water pipe from the bottom here the whole length up to the top there which we will connect to a hose every time every evening when we finished milling we'll connect a hose up to this fitting at the bottom and if there's a fire we just need somebody to open a tap and wet the thatch if that had been possible last time perhaps the mill wouldn't have burnt always it was a consideration because the cap turns of how to connect water to the sprinklers on the cap but this way whether it's facing in one direction the most of the summer or the other direction for most of the winter all we have to do is to reel out a hose and connect it up. This is the top end of the tail pole. The tail pole is at 20 degrees from the vertical. So I had to cut this at 20 degrees and we also don't want water standing on the top so this is actually 30 degrees so it is the water will run away from uh, the beam that this will be attached to. The hole is already drilled in the short stretcher underneath the back window of the mill frame and so the last lift of the crane when it comes to help us assemble it will be to lift this and to push this into the hole in the back of the cap frame and put a nut on the inside and then we can just put a block underneath the, the bottom end and the crane can go. Shortly after the fire I started uh, posting updates on the, my Facebook page and we got a we were contacted by John Stevens here from Floors Cape in Maitland who had a huge pile of old wood that probably came from some uh, maritime application uh, there's Belinga and there's Eki and he said I think I've got the materials you need to make the cap frame out of so the wood was too short to make the shears those are the two long backbone pieces that are on either side uh, of the cap frame they weren't long enough for that so John had to make a scarf joint in each of them to make them long enough uh, the eki is what the shears are made out of and this is Belinga. These are called outriggers or somstrala in, in Dutch. And we, uh, I left him to do the accepted carpentry joints because that's his line of business where the one piece is let into the other. You can see it's nice old wood here are old wormholes and things like that which is going to make the whole cap frame look old uh, as opposed to something made with brand new wood. Yeah, so as Andy said these are um, Bilinga, the outriggers and we did a step mortise and tenon joint here to connect that to the shear. Um, we've just glued and jointed, uh, glued and screwed the um, the ring onto the outriggers. Perhaps you can explain uh, the complicated joints here of the. This is the sprattle beam. That is the dead centre of the uh, mill, and it has to be adjusted longitudinally and also. Uh, well, sideways and longitudinally. And so there's some very complicated uh, wedges that we've had to make here. This one so that the wedge doesn't fall out uh, while it's moved from side to side. So this is actually between the two shears. And also there are other wedges that go from each side 
to be able to move it longitudinally. Uh, they, that is held down by bridge pieces which are over there uh, that go over the top here and fix it onto the top of the uh, shears so that it can't lift up. Uh, at the back there we've got the uh, tail beam that's, which is actually tenoned into the two shears and also partly lies on top of it and that's also held down by those covers there with the angles on them. That has to be at 10 degrees to the horizontal uh, because the whole wind shaft is, lies at uh, 10 degrees from the horizontal. In here, to support the vertical shaft, there are two halves of African blackwood uh, which uh, are hideously expensive. Luckily, John had uh, a piece which he could, uh, could uh, sell us, uh, and those are caught between the sprattle beam, half in the sprattle beam and half in this bridge piece here. The other piece at the back there, also Eki, I presume, yeah. is called the... Uh, Burgemeister, the, uh, the mayor, that is between the two shears, right in the very front, and that supports the weight of the wind shaft, which is very heavy uh, in, the, in the middle at the front. This is the front gable. We're looking at the inside. The wind shaft will pass through this gap here on the stone bearing, which will be supported at that same angle of 10 degrees uh, in this opening. In fact, this whole unit lies over at 10 degrees from the horizontal. And you can see there's a diagonal beam there, which is there to supposedly absorb the fact that the wind shaft turns this way around. And on this side, there's a re removable storm hatch, we call it, so that we can open it up and deal with problems on the wind shaft on the outside um, if there's anything. In fact, it's actually quite nice to have it open when you're milling because the wind comes through this way and it gives you some breeze on the inside. Also made of the same old wood, uh, it's going to very definitely, you can see here, look old from new. This now is the rear gable also looking from the inside, it's actually attached to what's called the short stretcher, which is part of the mechanism which turns the whole cap uh, into the wind. We've got another storm hatch on this side that we can just have open, and the one on, let's just work it out, that side has got the brake lever which comes through. So this will still have to be cut out for that uh, and the brake lever sticks way, way out at the back and operates through onto a system of levers here. So there will be, we'll still have to cut a slot here for the hook that the brake lever hangs from there. Otherwise the whole window is also removable so there's plenty of air that can pass through if it's a hot stuffy day. Uh, also, looking old from new, you can see uh, this is really what I asked John to achieve in remaking this uh, mill, is that it mustn't look brand new. Behind the short stretcher is the long stretcher, that is 12 metres long. I had to do a scarf joint in the middle of that to get it long enough. and. Above us here are the beams which are called the long and the short braces. They're the diagonals that attach the tail pole to the ends of the long and the short stretches. The, the lighter one there will be cut in half. That makes a small triangle at the top. And the two long ones are the ones that go from the bottom of the tail pole to the very ends of the long stretcher here. The leading edge of the sails, um, 
we managed to salvage one side that wasn't burnt so that we can use it as a template for when we make new with all the cleats and, um, and brackets in the right place. So what's important here is that the sails are not parallel with the sail stocks. They have got what's called an angle of weather, about 22 degrees at the base nearest the wind shaft, and it gradually twists to almost parallel with the direction that the sails go around at the tips. Building contractors here, Bruce Dundas, have done a magnificent job of replastering the entire inside, with the exception of where the roof, uh, the floor beams, the floor planks go into the wall. They've left a gap there. Uh, they haven't closed the cracks in the outside plaster the decision was rather to open them up the cracks up a little bit put a standard steel mesh inside and then plaster it over and to fill the gap between the mud break bricks and the plaster with a slurry of the same lime plaster that's all that's been used here is just lime and river sand with a plasticizer with it so we no cement has been used whatsoever. All the inside plaster was removed. It's been plastered again just with lime and river sand. The gap between the plaster on this ground floor and the next floor up has been left for where the floor planks go right into the plaster and then the contractors will plaster up against the floor and down against the floor above. That is after the beams have been put back in and the planks have been put on top of it. My particular interest today was to check the top surface of the tower here where the curb, the wooden curb ring will be uh, lowered down over the studs uh, in the next couple of weeks. I wanted to make sure that it was smooth enough here and that the studs were clear of cement or the, the plaster that they've used uh, to build up this surface. So this is completely flat and level all the way around and we've measured the distance apart of the studs. They're irregularly spaced but uh, we've measured them and we plotted the holes on the wooden curb, so hopefully the curb will just lower down onto all of these studs and we can run the nuts up. Then the next stage will be to smear the top of the curb with lard, which is being prepared at the moment, and immediately after that the crane will lift the cap frame assembled onto this and into, onto and inside the curb ring on the top here. We're at a very exciting stage now. We've been at the rebuild, thinking of very little else, for a year and nearly two months now. We've been making the wooden components, knowing that we will eventually get permission to work on this place. We waited 11 months to be able to work on the tower itself. The contractors moved in straight away and now we're at the stage where we've made all the wooden components uh, either in Hrabo or in Maitland and we're ready to bring the first of those wooden components through in two days time. Here you can see the gap that's been left again for the floor planks between this upper floor, the dust floor they call it, and the stones floor 
and you can see the stainless steel mesh that has been uh, added behind the lime plaster. This is the old threshing floor where the farmer would have laid his wheat out still on the stalk and chased donkeys or horses around to loosen the wheat out of the ears. We're using it uh, next week to assemble the cap frame on in and so we marked out exactly on the ground where the long stretcher will be, the short stretcher at the back, the cap circle is marked out and the Bergemeister which I mentioned which supports the weight of the wind shaft between these two drums. So on Wednesday, two days time, the cap circle will be assembled on the top of these drums. The glue will be left to dry for a couple of days and then the cap frame will be assembled on top of it and then John will be able to screw through the cap circle into, his, into the components of his cap frame. What we are doing now is spraying at the wall with the antifungi yeah, to prepare good. to remove all the old paint and the fungi before we apply another coat or a new coat of paint. The wall um, for 48 hours and then we pressure wash it off. Oh, I see.